Thank you, Nate, and thank you all for being here, and shout out to my husband and kids. Thank you, Nate. Um, as Nate mentioned, in my design practice, we do strive for a seamless connection between architecture, interior design, and art. Um, it's just so much more pleasing to be inside of a space, whether it's indoors or outdoors, when there's um, a, a connection between all of these disciplines. Uh, I believe that art, and specifically cult, cult, sculpture, excuse me, can really provide the punctuation mark on successful interiors. So we love working with artists to define and enhance spaces. And I have long admired the work of our speakers tonight. So without further ado, let me introduce our speakers. Artist Brad Goldberg is an idea generator who's worked collaboratively with artists, design professionals, civic leaders, and communities. Whether working with architects and engineers, craftsmen and contractors, or fabricating his own work, Brad is experienced in dealing with the realities of creating an artwork within a complex environment. Brad sees his work as a fusion between sculpture, landscape, and the built environment. His work can be seen in prominent locations in Dallas and across Texas, as well as nationally and internationally. Brad believes that sculptures are seen not as isolated objects, but rather as components of larger spatial experiences. For over 35 years, Sherry Owens has used the sinewy crepe myrtle tree to tell her story of the Texas landscape of death renewal, beauty, and of today's growing environmental concerns. The choice of each stick, each gesture, and each connecting point resembles the marks of drawing in third dimension. Sherry's a native of Texas. She uh, lives and works in Dallas, and her work has been shown throughout Texas and the Southwest, including the Grace Museum in Abilene, Chris Worley Fine Arts, in Dallas and the Umlauf Sculpture Garden in Austin, just to name a few. She's also completed several large public artworks, uh, including a large scale bronze at Dallas's Love Field and a monumental commission for the Benny Keith Company, also here in Dallas. Sherry's received several awards for her work, including the Artist Craftsman Award uh, from AIA Dallas. Jay Shen is a Dallas-based, internationally exhibited artist, focusing the last few years on practice from his studios in New York and Berlin. Shen's art practice is a reflection on nature and architecture, which has directed a multimedia approach to art making. He's known for his large-scale, light-based, site-specific installations with projections and neon wall sculptures. However, his current body of work is a deliberate return to painting, so he's well-versed in both two- and three-dimensional forms. Jay has created several site-specific public art commissions at locations including Houston's International, I'm sorry, Intercontinental Airport, Texas A&M University, and Arrowhead Stadium in Kansas City. His works are in numerous other public and private international collections. Most recently, an eight-year survey of his work was exhibited at the Till Richter Museum in Bugenhagen, Germany. Jay is represented by Barry Whistler Gallery in Dallas and Moody Gallery in Houston. Please help me welcome Brad Goldberg to the podium. Hello. Thank you for coming tonight. And thank you, Wendy. Um, to start with, I will tell you that I use photography as a means to record that which inspires me. And from literally thousands of images, I'll just show several and um, give you a sense, and then I'll give you a sense of how those photographs often influence my work as a sculptor. Let's see. Whoops, I already made a mistake. Okay. So my touchstone in Texas has always been enchanted rock, one billion years old. The alignments of Karnak in Brittany, in France, 
has always influenced me. Callanish in the Outer Hebrides of Scotland, off the west coast of Scotland, Avebury in Wiltshire, England, and this, what looks like a, a fortress is actually a place of spirituality in the Aran Islands off the coast of Ireland, on the island of Inishmore, and a Roman encampment in the middle of France in the Limousin area. I've done a lot of work in Japan, and the craftsmanship of Japan always inspires me to um, do work. And in the city of Suzhou in China, um, in the scholars' gardens, the Chinese garden, you'll find this integration between architecture, landscape, nature, and mystery. This is an image from Ayan Pei. Ayan Pei was born in Suzhou and um, did this sort of uh, window, series of windows that, that uh, reflect upon the Chinese garden for the Suzhou Museum of Art. I'm very inspired by stone quarries all over the world. Uh, this is in Carrara, Italy. This is in China, where we quarried stone for a project. And this is um, an image just a couple of months ago in South Dakota, quarrying granite for a project. It's very architectural, this, these quarries are. And I'm inspired by the work of James Terrell, Roden Crater specifically, and worked with James Terrell for several years on realizing some of the stone elements for Roden Crater. This is the uh, um, image stone in the entrance to the crater. This is the east portal looking out towards the eye of the crater. And this is the, the eye of the crater itself. And to give, give you a sense of scale, uh, this is, those are 18-wheeler trucks down there and a crane, and on the right is the East Portal. Uh, so it's a very big space uh, indeed. I use photography as a way of taking photographs of brain coral, macro photographs of brain coral in Miami for a project at the Inter Miami International Airport. And um, I took those photographs and made them 30 feet wide by 90 feet tall from baggage claim to a skylight at the top of a building and uh, passes through multiple floor plates. The stone came from Tivoli in Italy, the same stone that was used on the Nasher Museum. And I spent oh, over uh, approximately a year fabricating and carving this work. Uh, you can see it through the building. Uh, here's the building, the new terminal architecture. And from the third floor, you can look up and see the skylight above, and you can look down towards the baggage claim. And this gives you a sense of that looking up from baggage claim and looking down from the skylight. In San Jose, California, these photographs show uh, the um, apricot orchards and prune orchards that dominated the valley. Later on, in the 50, late 50s and 60s, came the computer chip, the first semiconductor. And I did a piece where the Silicon Valley has changed forever, uh, a building called the Tech Museum of Innovation by Ricardo Legareta. And I did a piece for the main uh, atrium of the building. Uh, essentially, it's a landscape, but it also has a nine-foot diameter by 52-foot tall uh, cylinder that's completely covered with 24-karat gold. You enter through a portal on the bottom and look up, and as you look up, you see suspended inside the tower um, the root system of an apricot tree. In Oklahoma City, in the aftermath of the bombing, the government built a memorial on that site, and catty corner to that, the General Services Administration built 
a new building to replace the Murrah. Uh, I did a piece uh, for that building, and it was rather defensive work. Um, I can explain that later. Um, you um, can see the um, place where I got the boulders from in, in uh, western Oklahoma. And here you see the boulders, some 50 truckloads of boulders from uh, those mountains. And you can see a spring coming up and the water rushes at the base of the, of the stones and creates an auditory f effect. I'm really interested in the way granite is quarried, um, often with drills, and they result in drill marks that are on the blocks, and use this technique for a piece at the Spring Creek Nature Preserve in uh, Richardson. Um, there are two entrances that uh, uh, lead to a 180 acre nature preserve. This is installing it, and this is another view of it. And in the um, area northeast of El Paso is a place called Hueco Tanks. And Hueco Tanks has been inhabited by peoples for a thousand years. And I worked with the Dallas office of Perkins and Will with Ron Stelmarski. And I made my own boulders uh, as places to sit underneath a uh, grove of Palo Verde trees. And there you see it from above. Trying to create shade in the desert. And finally, uh, well this isn't finally, but this is the great Wabash River in Indiana. And a block from there is the county courthouse. And there's Diana. Uh, Diana is my partner in life and work. and. Um, across from her uh, is the, the uh, city hall. Uh, the piece is eight foot wide by 42 feet long and features a, a river that goes through it, one block from the real river. Uh, there you see it towards the courthouse. There you see it towards city hall. And finally, this is a piece, um, this is a great 200 year old oak tree. And these oak trees filled the perimeter of this full city block in downtown Raleigh. I worked in collaboration with Sasaki Associates in Boston and came up with this idea of grove rooms and did some what I call grove rooms that are um, underneath the trees. Uh, the first one is an elliptical spiral, a place as a, as a respite, you know, a place of refuge, rather, from the busyness of this park. And the other is uh, a community table. And the community table is 50 some odd feet long, has movable seating, and a uh, elliptical space uh, around it. And that's my presentation. Thank you. I have notes. No one else has notes. Um, <laughs> um, well, most of you know my work um, dealing with crepe myrtle trees. Um, and, but before, I've done that for like 35 years, but before I worked with crepe myrtle, I was a weaver. And I, did, I wove tapestry. And I'm still a weaver. I'm just weaving now with a rigid line with sticks. Uh, so I respond to work that is meaningful, um, significant, and also work that creates a sense of awe. And I'm gonna give you a glimpse of 10 other sculptor's works who I just love, I really admire, um, just to give you an idea of uh, the other kind of work that does inspire my work. Uh, the first person is Anne Hamilton. And Anne Hamilton um, was born in 56 in Lima, Ohio. She lives in Columbus, Ohio now, and this piece is titled The Event of a Thread, and it's a piece that she did in 2012 um, at the, uh, in December of 2012, at the Park Avenue Armory in New York, and a lot of her work is a connection between text and textiles. Uh, she's known for large-scale multimedia installations. Uh, in this particular piece, there were 42 swings. You can see these two people on one swing, and when, when all the swings are going in the armory, 
uh, there's pulleys up above this white cloth and they activate this cloth. So this cloth is billowing and moving. And then at the end uh, of the room here, you see two people that are reading to these cages of pigeons. And there's a, a timed release that happens with these pigeons and then they come back to the to the cage. Uh, <laughs> the, this ne next work uh, is two sculptors. Uh, this is at the Kinder uh, building at the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, which was designed by Stephen Hall Architects. And if you haven't been to this building, you need to go see it. It's just absolutely exquisite, a perfect place uh, to uh, show art. Uh, the piece in the background is El Anitsui, who is a, a, a sculptor from Ghana, born in 1944. Uh, and this this was a piece that the Kinder uh, commissioned uh, of him, and it wraps all the way around the room. I don't even have the whole piece showing, but it's called Visitation. Uh, it, it was made in 2020. He uses discarded liquor bottle caps, found aluminum, and copper wire. And then the piece in the front is by Martin Purrier, who was born in 41 uh, in Washington, D.C. He lived in Chicago for a while, and now he lives in New York's Hudson Valley, and the title of this piece is a shock okay a shock okay and it was made in 2019 it's bronze and uh, and a shock okay is a traditional nigerian cap with a crown that flips over the ear and i know most of you have seen at the modern in fort worth the 36 foot um, ladder for booker t washington uh, that was commissioned by the modern in 1996 and it was made from a single split sapling ash tree so he's a favorite of mine uh, this is the work, uh, A Spider, by Louise Bourgeois. She lived from 1911 to 2010, so she was 98. Um, this, this spider was made in 1966, and it's at the Best Off Sculpture Garden, which is next to the New Orleans Museum of Art. Uh, Louise is known for her large-scale sculpture and installation work, and she, uh, her work is about her childhood traumas and insecurities that surrounded her and the spider she's done many different kinds of spiders but this particular spider is a metaphor for her mother who repairs things and her parents when she was growing up she she was born in paris and uh and her parents had a tapestry restoration shop they lived in an apartment upstairs and then the shop was downstairs and uh louise used to fill in the designs of uh all of the worn tapestries at the bottom so she'd be working with characters' feet and, uh, and the animals, uh, uh, their toes and their paws. Um, anyway, I, I could tell you a lot more about Louise, but uh, you'll also see in on the left side at the back, you see that bronze horse. That's Deborah Butterfield, who is also a huge favorite of mine. Uh, Deborah was born in 49 and divides her time between a farm in Bozeman, Montana, and a studio in Hawaii. And she's known for her sculptures of horses made from found metal objects and driftwood and which is this is cast in bronze uh, this uh, artist is Norma Minkowitz who was born in New York in 1937 the title of this piece is boy in a tree made in 2001 uh, it's wood fiber paint wire resin and it's uh, crocheted and knitted and she's really she's really taken uh, this um, technique of crocheting and knitted beyond um, beyond its normal function. Uh, she uses human form to express psychological complexities and observations of human behavior. Uh, this work is by Nick Cave. Um, he was born in 59 in Fulton, Missouri, and now he lives in Chicago, and he's known for his sound suit series. I'm sure many of you have seen some of those works. Uh, they're wearable assemblage fabric sculptures that are bright, whimsical, and otherworldly, often made with found objects. He also trained as a dancer with Alvin Ailey, and often he incorporates dance and performance into his works. And in Chicago, he directs the graduate fashion program at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Uh, he had a retrospective that opened last May at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago, and then after that it traveled to the Guggenheim in New York, and I saw this piece um, in Chicago. And the title of this is Amalgam. It's cast bronze. It's one of his first uh, large-scale bronze human figures, uh, kind of a tree of life. And what he says about this is that it is a call to replace historical monuments to racism 
and I can't read my um, to <laughs> to racism, and um, I'm sorry. I do have a flashlight here. Uh, well, he's wa he wants to replace these uh, with pieces that look toward the future and honor the amalgamation um, of diverse cultures and communities. His work is just, it's just really awesome. Uh, so you see there is the, the head and shoulders explodes into trees and birds. This work is by Yoshimi Futamura, who is a Japanese artist born in 59. She now lives in Paris. The title of this piece is Big Birth. And I saw this piece at the Crow Collection back in April of 2019 from a uh, Japanese contemporary ceramic exhibition. It's made of stoneware and porcelain slip. Uh, uh, it's inspired by nature, but reflects the natural kiln effects. Uh, and in an interview, she said that her work showcases the materiality of her medium, which is the earth. And also her artwork can be read within the concept of wabi-sabi, or, imper or imperfect, incomplete beauty. The irregularity of her pieces only increases their meditative quality. And I ascribe to that. I, I'm a real wabi-sabi believer in my work as well. Uh, and this last piece is the Tarot Garden in Garavecchio, Italy. Uh, it's a sculpture garden based on the 22 major arcana of the, of the Tarot. Uh, it was created by Nikki de Saint Fal, who lived from 1930 to 2002. And she was a French American artist. She, st she started the construction in 1979 and opened, um, and, the, and the garden opened in 1998. So it took her 18 years to complete. And she lived inside the Empress when it was under construction. Uh, it's So the whole garden uh, is 22 steel and concrete sculptures mosaic in mirrors, glass and ceramics. And then in the foreground you see the work, the kinetic steel work of uh, Jean Tingley. Um, and he was a Swiss sculptor from 1925 to 1991. Uh, and they were also married and did a lot of collaborative pieces. But if you have not been to the Tarot Garden, you must go. I was there in 2017 and I can't wait to get back. Um, okay, these next few slides are some other uh, things that have inspired me. Um, I was in, uh, I was at a chocolate shop in Thessaloniki, Greece in 2018, and those stilettos are made of chocolate. So uh, <laughs> they're pretty impressive. Um, and this is also in Greece. This is it at the, at the Edessa Waterfalls, and I stood right behind this gal. Um, I mean, I love waterfalls, but the thing that intrigued me was her hair. I thought the way she braided her hair that day, she was just, you know, thinking about those waterfalls. And <laughs> so I, I think that's very inspirational to me. I, I love hair, and I've done all kinds of projects with hair. Um, I also have a small pond at my house, and in uh, February of 21, when the, uh, Dallas was shut down from the freeze, my waterfall was freezing. And um, But this, is, is to me, it's like a mini version of, uh, of larger land formations. Um, and then this next work is... Uh, um, well, this piece, uh, these conjoined trees are from Naosa, Greece, which is on the Aegean Seas. And a lot of the work that I do, I'll, I'll use this imagery of pairing two pieces together. So um, the next uh, uh, image is from Lake La Pointe in Louisiana, and these are cypress trees and knees. And then this next image is from Jefferson, Texas. This is a spider web, and you will see something in a few minutes uh, very similar to this same structure of this web. Um, Okay, this is uh, in November of 2016. I was in Hilmsen, Germany at a um, artist residency, and I was out in the courtyard, and I saw all these webs. Uh, I saw the, these spider webs everywhere, and I was like, oh, my God. I thought that the, uh, an artist had made these structures because the webs were really thick, and everyone was like, what? No, those are spider webs. And I was like, well, how big is that spider? And, <laughs> and, and it wasn't that the spider spiders were so big, it's that these have hoar frost on them, and I had never seen hoar frost. So I went back the following year in the summer, no webs were anywhere. So they were indeed um, hoar frost on the webs. Um, then this next image is from uh, Quintana Roo, Mexico, uh, the beach, and I'm always inspired by the beach and the seaweed, and many of the drawings that I do, um, 
who kind of look like this. You know, they're, <laughs> they're, I really have, to, uh, I, I work with gesture and movement. And so um, I'm, when I go to the beach, I probably take 200 pictures of, you know, the water. And um, this is San Antonio Birds at Dusk. And here again, I'm looking at movement as well as the sound. It was just, I mean, I was pumping gas in San Antonio and all of a sudden, all of this commotion started. So I probably have 30 pictures of these birds. Uh, <laughs> And then these are feeding the koi at the Fort Worth Botanical Gardens. And here again, I'm looking at the motion and the sound, uh, which now leads me to um, images of my work. This is Buffalo Stampede, uh, which was created between 2010 and 16 for the Benny Keith Company. Uh, and this piece is about, it's got probably about 70 pieces that overlap. It's all crepe myrtle and um, about 22 feet long, 10 feet high. And the herd of buffalo at the bottom comes out from the wall about 18 inches and then as the buffalo go up the sticks get smaller and lighter in brown to sort of create like a, a you know an image of um, of them stampeding right towards you so um, that's that piece uh, this one is called the embrace of heaven and earth and it's bronze and it's basically two small trees and you'll see the roots at the top and then the roots at the bottom uh, when this piece was installed it was installed in uh, a person's uh, small yard in, in a small garden and so the steel base went away and then that root at the bottom is actually on top of the gravel um, okay now let's see so this next piece is called guardians this is from 2019 this is all crepe myrtle and uh, wire and uh, dye and wax and here you see these uh, guardians that are protecting the earth and the black areas are burned crepe myrtle and they have been wired into the structure those are representing their armaments or their weapons um, then this piece is called Twirling Like a Seed in the Wind from 2013. Uh, I was invited uh, by the um, Art Museum of Southeast Texas in Beaumont to be in a self-portrait show. So I cast my feet in bronze. So if you, well, they're kind of cut off there, but if you look down at the right bottom, those are my feet cast in bronze. So, <laughs> um, and this next piece um, is called Waiting for the Feast, and this is a spider web cast in bronze that I did in 2019. So I made a spider web with hoarfrost. And, and I, I've done a whole series of these. Um, so boy, when I saw those spider webs in uh, Germany, it just, th this is what happened when I saw those. Um, then the next piece is Mother Nature throwing up her hands. Um, and here again, I've used uh, baling wire and um, uh, the white portion of the of the piece is all more formally carved and dyed and waxed and then I took uh, other parts of crepe myrtle and hacked away at it with a little hatchet and burned it and uh, and then wired that into mother nature uh, and she's throwing up her hands because she's um, upset with what's going on in the you know in climate so this piece is actually um, on view right now at the Ogden Museum of Southern Art in New Orleans in the 20th anniversary exhibition knowing who we are and it'll be up through March 3rd of next year so if you go to New Orleans you can go see it and then another part of my practice uh, that's really important is um, I do collaborations with another sculptor from Dallas Art Shire who's somewhere in the audience and this is a this is a detail of a piece that we did in 2018 at the umlauf uh, in, in Austin. And basically, it's three vortexes that are constructed on site uh, using the large beams in the ceiling. Uh, we've got over 20,000 pieces of glass. Uh, handmade rocks are swirling around each vortex. And we, um, we were in the museum for two weeks, day and night, working on this piece. So it was very intense. Um, and then the last slide is Learning to Fly, which is another collaboration collaboration we just completed and it opened over Earth Day um, or, um, this this year uh, at Splendora Gardens which is the home of James Searle's Texas studio and the title of the show is a gift from the Bower uh, we were invited to create a site-specific piece in one of 13 outdoor bowers which are clearings on the land um, and we created an overhead cosmos 12 to 14 inches of 12 to 14 feet off of the ground uh, uh, with a mother construction that cuts through the um, 
the canopy, and uh, that mother construction is sort of the heart of a star nursery. And you can actually stand inside of that, and if you look up, you look up into a, an opening, a clear circular opening up to the sky. Uh, the whole bower was about 90 feet in circumference, um, and then there was a steel kinetic sound sculpture in the space, and we built a chalkboard for visitors to leave comments, um, and we worked with a writer in Dallas, Kendra Green, who was just awesome, and she wrote a wonderful poem. If you go to the website uh, giftfromthebower.org, you can read more about this exhibition, and it is open uh, every Saturday from 11 to 4 um, uh, until October the 23rd, I think it is. That's it! <laughs> Well, I appreciate you coming to this tonight, and thank you for the invitation to get to present my work to this group. It's really a, a great thing to go back and reflect on, on how we got to where we are anyway. That was the biggest exercise of this whole thing, planning that. Uh, as you can see up there, as a child of the 60s, one that's wanting to be an artist, since I was eight, uh, I, I painted landscapes, portraits, flowers, all of that as hard as I could till the seventh, eighth grade. At that point, I started seeing more and more art out there. And the work of Bridget Riley, this is Circuit from 1961, and op art. It was kind of a transition for me to work into op art into the other as, as I fell more into abstraction and felt like I was able to do a lot more uh, and, and get more satisfaction out of works that, that, I, that came from my mind. Looking at influences too, later on, like with architecture, how a sense of place and uh, having art in, in, a, in a space, how it's influenced by the materials as I go back and forth uh, with different materials that has pushed me through always. This is the Seagram's building on Park Avenue in New York. This is one of my favorite buildings in Berlin, Germany, the Mies van der Rohe. Uh, this was one of his final works built in 1968. Eight, excuse, 1965, 68, right in there was one of his final works, uh, the New National Gallery, uh, which is really a fine example of how he used materials. He was basically the father of the glass, sky, glass and steel skyscraper. This is a perfect example of indoor outdoor space, which is important in my work. For those of you that are not familiar with this museum, this glass atrium over uh, glass pavilion over the top of it is an open space where exhibits can change their sculpture around the top, but below grade with that plinth right there where it sits, that's where the main box of the museum is with white box galleries, typical galleries with German art. I'm going to talk about three, three sculptors, painters, that artists that influenced my work. I had the uh, opportunity to attend Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture back in 81. This is one of the uh, resident artists. That's a summer program, nine-week intensive, when you're there with like six uh, major artists that stay the whole time and then visiting artists that came through to that summer. Uh, during that time, I had, that's when I really started working more three-dimensional. I went there as a painter, and I left doing more three-dimensional work. This X is at the Corcoran Gallery in, uh, in Washington, D.C. It was an installation by Ronald Bladen, one that when I was at Skowhegan, he ran the sculpture yard there, and he was there working on his work. And I got close to him. He pushed me into working three-dimensional, and you know, he had the attitude of, of just go for it, do it, whatever your ideas are. And it was great to have that. His work was somewhat minimal. Uh, this is at MoMA. Uh, they were, even though the work is minimal, it's very much geometrical abstractions in space. Okay, moving forward, another influence from Skowhegan, Milton Resnick, an abstract expressionist painter, uh, who was a contemporary of, at Black Mountain College of Willem de Kooning, Elaine de Kooning. He was part of that, one of the lesser known uh, abstract expressionist painters. He was there all summer with his wife, Pat Pazloff, who was also a, a, a painter, that uh, we worked with him. Milton came around, these, these great artists would come around to your studio once or twice a week, plus you live there with them. There were only 65 of us for the nine weeks. One of the things as an abstract expressionist, you know, he, he pushed me to, to use light in my work. You know, inspiration comes in odd places. You wouldn't think an abstract expressionist like this. These are dense paintings where to him, he was, uh, often he said he was painting out demons 
demons. Some of his paintings, the, the larger ones, they could be as heavy as 300 pounds, and it was all oil paint. It was very much about the material, and that material as content in that is very important in my work. This artist, Via Selmans, uh, was also at Skowhegan that summer with me for nine weeks, and this is a pencil drawing of the ocean. She did uh, very meticulous things that were uh, very meditative, but she was really known for t the essential elements in a work and making it work. These are small pencil marks, uh, again, a pencil drawing of hers, but uh, she kind of worked with me to how to bear down to just the essential in a work of what is needed. There were moonscapes, there were uh, this sky space, but where the work really drove your space right into infinity. And kind of on a harder edge there is the work of James Sarah, who's had an influence on me. I think about Sarah more and more here lately uh, in the space in my work. I love the monumentality uh, of, the, of this work and trying to get monumentality in a, smaller, in a smaller work of art, be it in a small drawing or a small painting. But that's one thing I think about and push that feel. Going forward into another influence is as I, since about 2010, I've been spending more and more time in Europe and an important artist to me is Francois Morlay, another one that uses neon, like you'll see some of my neon pieces later. But he, he passed away in 2016, was 92 years old. But throughout Europe, uh, he's very was very well known. This is across the street from the Louvre, where it's a, a veil of with neon permanently installed on this building. You know, his his light works were very very much drawings in space with the neon. This is an example. I think being across from the Louvre, it, it's draped. It's almost it's as powerful as a Christo wrapped building, or it's also a reference maybe to the marble drapery on the statues and that at the Louvre. Now then going back to Texas with the, uh, at, the, at Rice University, the Terrell uh, Sky Space piece that was put there in 2014. This uh, work, I think it's one of just a great piece that pulls in all kind of elements, which is subconsciously what I try to do with my own work. But where this ties in nature, it ties in uh, architecture, it ties in science. For those of you, if you haven't been to Houston and seen this piece, how at dusk and in the, uh, at, in dusk and also in the evening or the morning, uh, it goes through a changing light show where, where as you look up in that sky and the, the sky changes, so it changes nature, it just, it, it's there on so many levels. Now I go into my work. I go back to Kansas City back, this was in 1981 when I was a student at Kansas City, one of my first monumental pieces. Growing up with a, a father that was a builder and always seeing things start from little things to where all of a sudden there's a building on a site. That was one thing that's always intrigued me about mural work or being able to work with, uh, with opportunities like this. This was one uh, that I had just gotten back from Europe as, a, as my first time too. And between what I was hearing about flying buttresses and Gothic cathedrals, that's where the imagery of this came from. It was on the side of a building inspections office. I won an award. I didn't get paid for it, but I had two painters <laughs> and all the materials I wanted. We spent about three weeks and put this out there. So it was quite an experience to realize something of scale going uh, still to the 80s right in there, kind of ending with Skowhegan work, going back to the essential where I was working more three dimension. Three dimension, these are more my columns. You can tell in this that uh, these, several of these are black and white. There is slight color there. I was very much a minimalist. I almost backed myself into a corner color-wise where I felt like I had to defend the use of color or what, even though I've, all my life I was a real colorist. But working with these, you can see the illusions that come in, the all overness from some of those other influences. And also, pretty it's, it's ironic it's black and white because then later, skip forward 20 years, I'm jumping over to where uh, I had felt I had the freedom to use color. These, I've always experimented with different materials, different, uh, different ways of making art. These pieces are wall paintings. This is probably about actual size of this piece that was painted on the wall. So it has two lives, one with the light on, one with the projected light on that gives it a new, new 
thing. Here's another projection. You know, I uh, work back and forth through different things. I've been working with those columns earlier uh, around 2005. I did more and more columns, and then I went from that into Lightworks that um, more of these projections. This is at 2100 Ross uh, on Ross Avenue here in Dallas with two. I actually have three projections in that office that are part paint, part projected. This is a piece from 2018 that is at Texas A&M University, the new uh, Zachary building. This piece that is kind of small in relation to the whole room, but the whole room is part of what makes my work or where my work comes from. I really enjoy working site specific, bringing that in. That goes through, that's a wall painting that's also has three projectors that does uh, a it does a, a sequence light projection on it. This is the piece at Houston Intercontinental from 2016 that uh, is like a, it's in Terminal D with the ticket counters underneath. While you're standing at the ticket counter, there's a gradual change of colors. You can see the projectors hanging down. There's like 12 projectors. That's 125 feet by 14. And then there's another one in the other end of the terminal that you'll have to go there to see. As I work with light, you can probably see uh, some Francois Morlay uh, inspiration there and others just on atmospheric space. When I think back of the gold piece that I showed you of, of Milton Resnick, the abstract expressionist, that feeling of space and how uh, it's an inf infinite space. That's, that's one thing that's important to me. This is another site-specific piece that was at Barry Whistler Gallery in 2016. You know, it was uh, site-specific for that space in the gallery. Barry's very generous with a beautiful big space that allowed a lot of space for this work to, to exist in along with the reflection. That's part of the same show, going back and forth with paintings. I did a series of these. There are about 140 something of these little panels that are each uh, a different image that's derived from that one shape. And then also, uh, as I did these, every time I tried to make a new color. It was, they were a color study too, in many ways. And I just kept doing them till I exhausted uh, the color in that. This is a little more recent. This is during the pandemic, the work I started really uh, pushing for, I felt like instead of a fa uh, practice where I was doing more fabricated work, which I loved during those fabrications, I was also doing a lot of drawing and painting. But around the time of the pandemic, I really wanted my practice to stay uh, in the studio and I wanted to be more of a studio artist instead of all over the place putting things together. This was a show in New York at the uh, Saatchi, former Saatchi building uh, last year that was up where you have two of the neon pieces and then they're on the back and then four paintings where even though those paintings are flat, you know, they're, they live in a three-dimensional space, very much about the negative space and what goes around them. This is a, a recent show. This was in January at Moody Gallery in Houston. These works were done within the last year. Again, working with that negative space in the center. Of some reason, I've always gone back to that, but to me, it's a way of that the painting or the sculpture is part of the wall, uh, part of the structure structure, part of the place it's in. Uh, again, still working more with those gradations, with some illusion, and work at looking for that monumental space. Here's a close-up in it. Going back to Mies van der Rohe, one of his sayings about less is more, and the other one is God is in the details. That's one thing with these paintings, you really need to be there to see the details where the lines built up and the, and the layering. Even though they seem hard-edged, I'm really beginning to use hand a lot more in the work as it goes. We'll end on this of the studio here in Dallas where you can see how much of the work in here now is this was just taken last week uh, with work such as the painting on the right up here the rectangle and under still in process and other things back there you can see the columns in the back some columns uh, wide and wood columns from around 2005 two or three years worth back in there but that's pretty much where I'm at and thanks and looking forward to the panel discussion So, um, as an interior designer, I'm fascinated by where you produce your work. And I love that you showed your space, Jay, so everyone kind of has a visual. I, I was very privileged to get to visit each of your studios. And what was so fascinating to me um, is how they really represent each of you. 
Sherry I had visited in her studio about 10 years ago and it's every bit as enchanting as it was then. It, it really is like stepping through the wardrobe into Narnia <laughs> and just endlessly inspirational. Conversely, Brad's studio is filled with his exquisite photography, which he says he has been shooting himself for as long as you can remember. And you got to see a little bit of it um, tonight. I'm so glad you shared. Um, his space is orderly and organized, but through that beautiful photography, you get the t you see the texture, and it's just as enchanting as Sherry's Narnia. Um, and then there was Jay's studio, which you got to see a little bit of it. Um, his studio he designed in collaboration with architects Ron Womack and Jim Langford and designer David Cadwallader. Right. Uh, it's beautiful. It's architectural, it's precise, and as you saw in that photo, it's light-filled and bright, just like Jay's work. So, I am getting to a question, I promise. <laughs> but I wanted to share that because as an outsider looking in, it, it appears that there's endless inspiration in each of your studios, yet I'm acutely aware that these spaces are not only where you create, but where you run your business where you work. And with work, of course, comes deadlines. You have bills to pay, etc. So I, I want to know if the pressures of the business side of your studio ever impede the creative side. And how do you reconcile this? I would say no, I'm just late. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, my, my pieces are built one stick at a time, and I don't have any assistance, and so I, I'm very slow, and, um, and, and that's just how it is. <laughs> and so anyone that takes on a project with me, uh, they have to understand that and understand that I, I want to do things on time, and every once in a while I make a deadline, but then there are times when... You know, like the Benny Keith project, that took six years, <laughs> you know? My life kind of got in the way, but, um, so I don't, um, I, I kind of, I try not to let that dictate, I, I, I try not to let a deadline um, make the integrity of the work suffer, you know? I, I want it to be what it needs to be, and fortunately, I've always worked with clients that are just so wonderful and fabulous, and they're like, whatever, it's okay, you know? So, yeah. I guess I am fortunate to have an assistant that helps me with those things, <laughs> yeah. uh, and I'm very blessed with that. But that's one thing that allows me to, to get in my zone when I'm at the studio, and my life is somewhat compartmentalized. But the studio is just, it's my haven. It's a very special place that when I'm there, I have to make the most of it because life pulls you in too many directions. So you go into the studio to, to create and you turn it on and I do. turn it on? I and okay. try to minimalize the rest of that with help. Takes a village. <laughs> <laughs> well, the nature of the work that I do is full of deadlines. And I have just learned to deal with that. However, some projects, I'm working on a project right now that's in its 14th year. Uh, the Miami project I showed you took 10 years. Um, not making for 10 years, but planning and all sorts of things. So a lot of it is uh, deadline driven. So that helps you. It inspires you. I have also have Diana. Okay. Since I had such a long question, I thought I would just open it up to you all. I won't hog the, the artist. Open it up to your questions. Does anyone have anything? <coughs> um, Brad, I am a big admirer of your photography, um, especially because you use black and white. I'm a huge fan of black and white. And I was just interested to know, do you use an iPhone, smartphone, or a film camera? <laughs> yeah, good question. I think, pardon me? Repeat the question. Oh, the question was, 
he admired the photography and wondered what kind of camera I use, whether it's an iPhone, a digital f- camera, or I- it's everything. I, I, I think it's whatever camera is with you at the moment you see something. And a lot of the photographs that I sh- showed are older photographs done on slide film with any camera that I happen to have point and shoot at that moment. Um, I use black and white because it makes all things equal. Yeah. I have a question uh, for all three of you. Um, I know when you're working with materials or in specific spaces, things are bound to go awry. What is the best happy accident that you've had with one of your pieces? <laughs> well, uh, well, I can think of something. Uh, <laughs> um, um, well, I had a show once, and uh, well, I've had several shows, but uh, but at one point I had an exhibition, and um, on the way coming back from that exhibition, I had all these pieces in a big box truck, and my driver uh, hit the curb, and the truck kind of went wall like this. And I was about, you know, five minutes from my studio. We get to the studio, we open up the back of the truck, and this one huge bronze piece had, the rope had broken, and it had hit another piece that was wood that was down on the, uh, <laughs> on the bed of the truck, and broke it in like, uh, uh, broke it all up. And so after crying for two weeks and being very distraught about it, um, I uh, decided to, um, to to make new work with all of those broken parts, which I did. I made three different pieces, and one of those pieces um, turned out to be um, uh, Mother Nature throwing up her hands, which, which is in the collection now, the Ogden Museum. So, so sometimes accidents uh, are good. They can. I mean, you have to look at them. I think uh, as a opportunity to go in a new direction. So uh, that was a good thing that happened at, at, at that instance. I would say that I, I'm a stone worker at heart. And as a stone worker, there is nothing but accidents. <laughs> <laughs> um, the material often does what it wants to do opposed to what you want to do to it. So it's learning how to deal with those accidents is, is also a huge part of that kind of work. I guess for me, I've had my share of accidents doing working with neon. That's something that it, there, it, you never know. There's always a surprise when you're shipping it, when it's installed in that. But I would say the happy accident, I guess, which was kind of a tough one. I, uh, one of my exhibits, I won't say who, where, what gallerist or what. I know Wandenberry Whistler here in Dallas. But with an installation that we've been planning on for so long, and then at the last minute, two days before opening, I had to do this big wall drawing. Uh, that was like 12 feet by 12 feet in the gallery and pull it off here two days for the opening in a major city. That was a little nerve wracking, but it turned out and it pushed me to do something that I wasn't doing otherwise. Got real fast with the chalk stream. <laughs> <laughs> and it worked. That was good. That was the good part. Um, Sherry, you mentioned at the end a collaborative piece. Mm-hmm. You said it was going to be open till October, and I'm sorry if you said this, but where is it? Uh, it is in um, sp- it is at Splendora Gardens, which is the uh, Texas studio of James Searles. You know, the last 22, 23 years he's been living in Colorado, but he still has that property. Um, and it's actually in Cleveland, Texas, which is about 45 minutes north of Houston. Uh, and if you go to giftfromthebower.org, uh, that tells you all about who all is uh, the artists that are in the show. And yeah, it's open every Saturday from 11 to 4 or by appointment. Uh, you just need to call and make arrangements, and it's free. Um, and it's just, it's really, um, it's a wonderful exhibition, and it was all planned. James and Charmaine had been planning this for years, and um, this was on the occasion of his 80th birthday when this was finally realized. So that's where it is. But it's, it's pretty fabulous. And all the artists have dealt with uh, the Bauer um, in different ways. They're all very different works. So 
that that's that piece. Uh, Sherry, can you describe your work at Love Field and tell me how you did it? <laughs> well, how much time do we have? Uh, well, that's uh, some of you have probably seen that piece. Um, I installed that in uh, October of 2012, um, and it's a series of seven bronze trees. Um, and they're 12 foot high. The trunks are nine foot high with about a three foot canopy. Um, and then there's also a small little vignette of, um, uh, of an aviator's coat and a helmet and goggles and the kind of goggles that had uh, pre-World War I goggles that had the, um, you know, the hinge here. Uh, in between the eyes, so they folded and had the fur around. And anyway, and um, um, and that was representing uh, early aviation at that time. Uh, uh, the uh, army came through, or the United States Army, they came through and they went to different cities and airfields. Um, and at that time, Love Field wasn't called Love Field; uh, it was just a city airport. And so they renamed all of these airports all over the country for United States to enter World War One. One, they renamed them after fallen aviators. Everyone thinks, oh, Love Field was named after Southwest. No, 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 it wasn't. It was named after <laughs> Mossley Love, who was a, a second lieutenant early in aviation, and he died doing a test flight over San Diego back in about, uh, well, it was a long time ago. It was before <laughs> the war. It was like in 1913, I guess, when he when he died. So he was one. He was the eighth aviator that had died, and that's how Love Field got its name. Anyway, but that piece is all cast bronze, and I worked uh, two years pretty much. That's all I did um, on that that piece. So it's the whole thing is bronze. Yeah, it, it'll it'll outlive me. You know, it's there forever. Yeah. Okay, we have time for two more questions. Yes, Jenny. Uh, this is for Brad. Can you speak a little bit about your work on the rodent crater and, and uh, if it's going to open or? <laughs> <laughs> that, that seems to be the question. <laughs> he just keeps going and going and going. I um, initially got involved uh, strangely, he was aware of my work and called James me. Terrell. Pardon me, uh, James Terrell. Yeah. Yes, and uh, called me and um, asked if I would be interested in joining the team for a little while. And um, I, of course, said yes. And uh, he wanted to make this thing called the Image Stone, but he was planning on doing it out of cast concrete. And I said to him, how can you make something called an image stone out of concrete? <laughs> and he said, could you make it out of stone? I said, sure, why not? So we did. Um, when it will open, he just keeps going and going and going and adding to it because it's really endless what he wants to do with that place. Wendy, I had a question for you. Um, I was wondering, in your practice, do you find that you're able to sometimes go to the artist at the beginning of it and work towards <coughs> filling a particular space, or can you sometimes bring that in at a very early stage if you're working with a particular architect or project that you've maybe been involved in for some time? So you're asking about commissioning a piece early on? versus or finding something in the gallery yeah absolutely I, I love when that happens um, and we have well either we find something that's already been realized and we can design the space around it or we often will work with artists and say okay we have a 20 foot high ceiling and you know, we need something that's, that we can enjoy on multiple levels or so forth. And to be able to take the client to meet the artist in their studio and have that through line to the end of the project is, is delightful. So, yeah, we love that. Okay, do we have time for it? Thank you so much for being here and thank you for all of our panelists.